Hello, Tile friends. Welcome back to another podcast episode, another live interview here in Facebook and YouTube. Thank you for joining me. Uh, it's good to see a couple people in here already. We've got another great interview uh, today. I am talking with uh, David Sandana, and he's got a great business. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram at Diligence Flooring on Instagram. Let me show you his Instagram. And, and this is this is actually his website. I was looking at this thing earlier. Just a beautiful website, uh, professional photos. Look at how, how this pops. I mean, when you take, when you pay someone to uh, do professional photography like this, it really makes all the difference on your websites. Um, and so that's what we're encouraging our customers to do over at happytileguy.com is to pay the extra to get professional fo fo photographs. And, and look at the difference. Even on Instagram, you can you can tell the difference um, right away, just professional photographs, you know, local scenes, uh, stuff like that. So I'm excited to talk to David. We're actually going to be focusing on uh, newer contractors. Some of you, you know, we've been talking to, uh, you know, I, I know I've been talking to some more experienced guys and, and kind of focusing on maybe some more advanced subjects recently. But we don't want to forget about those of you who are who are newer in business, maybe you're less than five years into the contracting world and you're just trying to get a, a, grasp, a grasp on this thing, um, we want to give you some encouragement. David's got about 15 years of experience, but his focus today, uh, our focus is talking to those of you maybe younger in the business or maybe some of, the, some of you who need some encouragement. We really want to encourage you and give you some ideas to grow your business and get a get a get a strong root system really going for your business. So before I bring David up to the stage for the interview, I'd like to thank my sponsors, the National Tile Contractors Association. They're the oldest association for tile contractors in the United States. If you're not familiar with what they can add to your business, look them up, the NTCA tile-ass and.com is is their website so the ntca as well as uh lady Cree international lady Cree international i mean they they invented thinset right here in the united states how cool is that and they're very innovative a very innovative company they're family run they're privately held company and, and their values I, I just love it so thank you lady Cree and the ntca for making tile money possible for sponsoring this podcast and uh facebook hello david how are you today I'm good. How are you doing, Luke? Doing real good. Tell everybody where you're at in the world and give us just a, a brief overview of your business, how long you've been in business, what you specialize in. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm out of uh, Washington State and we focus on Pierce County specifically. So that's about 25 miles south of Seattle. Um, we started out as a general flooring company in 2005 and then we've morphed into more of like a specialty business um, where we do a whole lot more tile you know, mainly kitchens and backsplashes and bathroom remodels. And then we have our share of commercial work we do, which is pretty extensive as well. Okay. Okay. And how many employees are you at this point? Right now we have five, including myself. Okay. And then we have bookkeeping staff and other stuff like that. So you've got staff on books and stuff like. Yeah. We, we have people we pay to take care of all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. That's a great idea. Well, I'd like to get into that. Um, you know, as, as we go on. Uh, but really, when I was talking with you about this interview, we were really talking about, you know, a lot of times we we look at, you know, I talk about profit, I talk about numbers, I talk about prices. And I, I see that it could it can at times be discouraging for younger guys, younger contractors. Um, so just keep in mind, guys, if you're new in the business, like Steve Roche used to say, you know, time plus consistency equals greatness. That's going to, you know, really, you have to put the time in, you have to be consistent, you have to be putting out quality work. And then eventually, you're going to be able to um, get up to some of these numbers we're talking about when we talk about things like that. So really, David, you know, give us some encouragement for new contractors for their mindset, maybe they're feeling a little discouraged, what would you tell them to start off? Um, when I started, uh, I was I was pretty young when I started my business, I was 23. And uh, now I'm 38, so I'll be 39 in a couple of months. The hard part getting started is, is feeling like you're able to be at the table with other people that have been there already. Because when I started, uh, you know, I started doing some shop work, but I didn't immediately get to work for a shop because they had guys that had been there for 10, 12 years or longer. Some of the guys are like in their late 50s and they're still working every day mm -hmm. um, and they take majority of that work. You know, I would just I would tell them to stick to it 
you know, don't don't give in thinking, well, I'm, I how come I can't be at the table with these people? Um, how can I compete with these other guys that have all this experience? And I always thought about it as like I have time on my side, you know, so I took the time approach rather than the experience approach. And I just developed my ability over that time. So now I'm, I have time and experience and I'm able to pretty much do what I need to do on a daily basis. And, you know, all those other things took care of themselves. Nice. So we're talking about a, a time span of, of about 15 years. If, if you could draw like a linear line, um, this would be actually a fun practice, but, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, we've been, we've been looking at so many graphs with COVID yeah. and stuff recently, but if you were going to draw a line from like year zero to 15, you know, I imagine it would look something like this. I should get a Sharpie. I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I'm understanding, it's like at year zero, you're over here, you know, and everybody else might be up here. And then as you get closer to year 15, mm -hmm. you know, you might, you might be making some headway here, here, but then you're eventually just going to go sh straight up. Is that right? Um, you'll go up. Yeah. I don't know about straight, but you, you go up pretty quick once you get enough, uh, people knowing who you are and, and what you do and you have tenure of, you know, successful job completions for people because it wasn't just the shop that I started working for back in 2005. Um, I still work for the salespeople at that shop now in 2020 and they're with different companies, but I still work for those same people. Mm -hmm. So you're building relationships tips that last to, you know, they know that 15 years ago, Dave did a great job. Every project since 2005 with them, Dave and his guys did a great job. The next job they call me on, they expect me to do that same job. So nice. I just consistency, consistency is what I did. But yeah, as you work with more people over time, well, what happens is now you have five people that have flooring jobs come up and they have 20 people and 100 people. And those people, the, the, the more numbers you have, of people knowing what you do and how you do such a good job, then what's going to happen is you might get three or four calls from your customer base a week, you know, and then you'll get the rest from somewhere else. And then you get your percentages and your referral numbers and all that. But yeah, so that eventually, yeah, you, you should take off more as time goes by as you do those jobs. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to just uh, be cumulative, cumulative, right? Tell yeah. me about working for somebody for, for, you know, getting leads or, or contracting with a company like that for for that long of a, a period of time. I mean, how do you how are you increasing your prices with them? Is it different or, or is it on an annual basis? How, how do you figure it factor that in? Uh, I haven't I haven't had to have that conversation with them. Um, they usually call me and ask a price. So when, when we do a job, uh, one example would be uh, the I got a call the other day to do a demo for the University of Puget Sound. Well, the University of Puget Sound is a private school um, and we have demolition equipment, you know, so we're valuable to people because a lot of people don't have that or, you know, it's very expensive and um, people don't usually buy that stuff and hold on to it for fun. So we have the equipment. They call us for the demo and um, we tell them a price. You know, and then they're like, OK, well, do you want to do the install, too, or do you want to do the prep work, too? And right now, unfortunately, we can't help, but um, we'll do the demo and, and disposal and, and let someone else do the prep work and install. Oh, wow. Just because you're so busy now. OK, there's a lot. Well, to I don't know about so busy, but, you know, we do, we're we busy enough. Yeah. I mean, so we, do, I, we do our work every day. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, where you. So in other words, you're not giving them a, a price list because I think what happens with a lot of stores or co even contractors repeat work like this is is they'll get they'll get really comfortable with a price list, whether that be like a literal price list or like, hey, we charge, you know, three thousand for a shower. And then 10 years later, well, we have the work because we're still working for the contractor from 10 years ago, but we're still charging three thousand for a shower. So in other words, you're saying you don't do that at all. You're It's just like, hey you know, we price the job out at well, job. Uh, yeah. from what I've experienced. I know um, I work, there's people that are going to see this at that work around here, you know, and they. Uh, so what I've seen is when they give you a price on a price list, you know, that's like that's like a suggested wholesale price. Mm. That's not the price. Right. Right. So the bottom line is if they don't have a shower in a the house, they can't close a loan. They're going to lose a closed date. And right now there's just not people to do the job. 
So I've been able to talk to the, you know, whatever flooring store that runs a, you know, the new construction or the commercial and just tell us that we can't work for that price. And then here's what we can do it for. And you do the math yourself and see if it's valuable to you. You know, um, if you can make money at it, that my job is to figure out how to make us make money. If I, if I'm saying we can do it for five bucks a foot, which we can't, but if we could, and we can make a good profit at that and pay everybody's wages and, then we would be able to work, operate at that. Um, if somebody says on new construction, we'll give you eight bucks a foot. If we can't do that, then we can't do it, but maybe 850 would work. And just depending on the volume and how quick we can do it, you know, people do math that way over speed versus over quantity and speed, each price per unit pretty much every time. Nice. That's a ex good explanation. All right. I'd like to back up a little bit too and kind of unpack this demolition, um, you know, kind of aspect. It's it's like a niche within a niche. That's the beautiful thing about flooring and tile. There's all these little niches within the niches that you can like, mm -hmm. you can add to your business, you can diversify. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. But, you know, because we're talking to young guys, I mean, you know, I mean, do you have ride on equipment? What does your equipment look like? Is it dustless? Yeah, it's all that. We have uh, we have like a single head Edco, which was our first grinder remover um, or a floor stripper. It's got carbides. It has um, diamond grinding bits. It's got, you know, cutters and stuff like that. So it has, I think it has PCDs for that one too. Um, then we have a, a national gladiator walk behind machine, which is a pretty hefty machine. Um, that's self-propelled. It has all the tooling you need. Um, then we have a planetary grinder. It's a national. It's like an 18 inch head. We got the vacu the vacuums, the separators. Then we have the small handheld equipment with the HEPA vacs, you know, and um, I have an, uh, what's called a, what's, what is that? Bartel Terminator. So it's a ride on Terminator. Um, and that thing takes floors off faster than you can. I mean, you can't even keep up with the, with removing it as fast as it's taken off the ground. So you need two to three guys just to remove the debris or else you won't be able to move the machine because it just makes a stack. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, th that's some of our equipment. Uh, then, you know, you have a bunch of handheld stuff and, you know, handheld tools like little Bosch Bulldogs and we have bigger ones. And, but yeah, we, we started getting demolition equipment because we needed it. Um, what happened because we needed it is other people need it too, but they don't want to spend $15,000 on one machine Yeah. or, you know, by the time you add it all up, over time, I mean, you're, you're spending a lot of money, one yeah. machine, $40,000. So yeah. um, the good thing about that machine, once it's paid for, it doesn't cost you a dime, but you can make $2,000 an hour tomorrow. So right. um, if it sits there, I'm, I'm cool with it because it's paid off. Um, but it makes you valuable to contractors as well because they have needs that they had need fulfilled. So they might call me for a demolition job. And then as we're talking, they see we do a good job in the demolition. Everything's removed to expectation. The job site's nice and clean. My guys put everything away. We talk at the end, shake your hand. They ask, what else do you guys do? Yeah. Well, we install the material too. They're like, oh, really? Oh, yeah, we got this. And so we've done a couple of car dealerships that way. We've done, you know, work in the malls, TIs, you know, a lot of shop work. Yeah. Um, you know, not, not like shop, shop as far as installation company, but shop as far as like a, a diamond store or jewelry store or, uh, record store, whatever. Well, I guess they're not records now, but they were. Yeah, yeah, they're cloud, cloud storage stores. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Hey, Chris, thanks for joining us, brother. Appreciate it. And I want to encourage anybody, if you have questions for David or myself, feel free to put them up. Tilo, good morning, brother, from California. Uh, thanks for joining us early and uh, have a good day out there in, in California, Tilo. Appreciate you and your support. Um, I do want to kind of unpack this this a little bit more because this, this could seem daunting for a new guy. You know, we're talking about $40,000 for one machine, 10,000 for a neck. Some of these HEP, HEPA vacs, you know, start at, um, you know, they, I mean, the cheapest HEPA vac I, I know of would, you know, our air filter would be $500. Um, tell, tell us like the basics. If, if somebody just wanted to start adding to their arsenal and that's what I would really suggest guys is, you know, um, start adding to your arsenal and start advertising. Hey, we're dustless. We've got this new HEPA air mover that's going to remove the dust. What What would you recommend? You know, kind of getting started with with that type of a system. I would get anything you can afford to get. To okay. Start, you know, 
So I wouldn't worry about getting the hill tier at the top of the line. You know, I, I would just buy something that helps you operate uh, effectively. Mm-hmm. You know, don't buy something that's supposed to be dustless. If it doesn't remove the dust when you're using it, take it back to the store and say this thing's not working. Get something that works, that doesn't cost you a fortune, that's affordable for you to work and, and going to handle the volume of floors you're doing or the job size you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I started out, I just rented a single head Edco and I rented it for like two weeks and I was like, man, this thing takes off adhesive like a boss, you know? And so I called the guy and said, Hey, how much, how much is this if it gets stolen? Cause I knew my rental was already up like a thousand bucks, like a right. thousand bucks. And he goes, I mean, 2,200 and some change. And I was like, well, just report it as, uh, report it as stolen or I can just pay you the 1200 cause I'm going to pay you. I'm not going to give you a thousand dollars and a machine back. You know, so if the depreciated value is only 22, I'll give you 1200 more and keep it, you know? So they just sold it to me for 1200 bucks. Really oh, that's smart. There you go. So that's how we got started. Yep. The rental place, a lot of them have a depreciation schedule and they'll say, right. well, this machine has, you know, the values at 40% and it could be a $3,000 machine and only cost you 1200 bucks. Wow. So that's, that's, a- how I, that's how I started. That's a great tip right there. I've never thought of that. Go rent a machine. First of all, rent rent some equipment. There, mm-hmm. it's a great way to make money. You can rent equipment. You could charge. You you should be marking it up. You know, at least fifty to one hundred percent the rental. Mm-hmm. So if you're paying five hundred bucks, charge a thousand for it, and, and that that kind of gives you a taste of it, or charge seven fifty minimum. Um, but and you know what's funny is my one of my first wet saws uh, was from a rental company because. Uh, because like you're saying, they need, you know, at some point they, they, you know, it was an ad and I bought it, but um, they need to get rid of this stuff and replace it. So they're happy to, to do it. So that's a great tip. Buy some, buy some used equipment like this um, from a rental place. That's an incredible tip. Thank you. I still have that machine. And you do? We, yeah, I, I bought it in 2009 and yeah. I use it all the time. I mean, it's the best concrete removing grinder uh, because it has such a, a heavy head pressure. Yeah. So the head pressure, it's on seven inches. My big one's 18. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, a hundred pounds on seven or 300 pounds on 18. You right. get better pressure. So it's going to take the material that faster. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. All right. Let's talk about, um, you know, using, utilizing the, the tools that you have right in front of you that sometimes we don't realize we have. Let's talk about the groups, just other contractors. Where do you go for help mm-hmm. when you're, when you're younger, when you're new? Well, talk to anybody you know that that has experience. I, I, I call people that weren't in the, in my industry, but were in business, you know? So if I saw someone that was successful, I would just say, hey, can we talk about this for a minute? Yeah. Here's what's going on. And I have people that I know that have other businesses that aren't in flooring, but they give you pointers, you know, they'll tell you what to do. I mean, it could be anybody. It doesn't have to be uh, a flooring guy. But a lot of the hard part about being in business is operating the business because you know how to do your job. Right. But the hard, you haven't learned the business side. You know, most of us, <laughs> I'll say I didn't know anything about it. So it's been a real school of hard knocks and, you know, pre iPhone stuff. And, uh, you know, so it's a, a lot more different gathering information then than it is now. Now it's pretty much, you can get a lot of information offline, but the mentor mentorship and stuff like that, Find someone that you respect, send out a, send out a, you can send a direct message nowadays to just about anybody and um, they'll usually reply or uh, someone close to you in your name, in your area, you know, talk to someone that you, you see around and I do it too. I have a guy that lives, he lives probably, I don't know, two miles or three miles from me. I've seen his van always parked in this place. And so one day I seen him in Seattle and I, I stopped and talked to him. I was like, Hey, don't you have a van down in this uh, area? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's where I live. And I was like, OK, well, here's what's going on. I talked to him and he's uh, he's been around for like 45 years and he's a mud guy. He goes down in California, but he they, people, you know, he goes from here to California and uh, he showed me some magazines he was in and all this other stuff for some houses. And so I just grabbed his number and I said, hey, if I got some questions down the road, can I give you a call and and pick your brain a little bit? And most time they say, sure. If they say no, then say, OK, well, I appreciate your time now. And it's not a problem. Yeah. You know, but most people will be like, oh, yeah, because they like to share what they know. Yeah. Like if you never if you never give any information, you pass away. That stuff's gone. Right. So most people will share what they know um, to an extent as far as helping you out. I mean, they won't probably give you all their time, but five, 10 minutes here and there is no problem. Yeah. 
Yeah, you've, you've hit on a great point here. And, you know, uh, I want to emphasize it. People want to share what they know, especially older people, especially successful people. I mean, it's what it's doing. It's it's uh, it's rubbing their ego a little bit. I mean, they, they were successful and maybe they're a little bit older in the career. Maybe they're retired. Maybe they're semi retired. And if they can help you out, if you're eager and soaking up their knowledge, I mean, they like that in general. Most almost everyone, you'd be surprised. You just say, hey, whether it's a realtor, you know, any sort of business person, man or woman you meet in your day-to-day -day activities, in your neighborhood, in your church, whatever the case might be, let them know, hey, I, I have a business. I'm, you know, I'm struggling. I, I do really good work, but hey, I was wondering, can we get, you know, I'll buy you a cup of coffee or whatever. Chances are they'll buy you a cup of coffee, but I'll buy you a cup of coffee and I'd just like to pick your brain, you know, and make a friend, you know, don't forget the five people you hang around should be, you know, should be further ahead of you. They're, they're those five people. You're kind of, they're your mentors they're your local mentors, whether that be in, you know, if you can do it in person, that's probably really powerful, but you can also do this on the online, on the internet and in different groups, different business groups. I think that's a great point. I'm really glad you, you brought that out is because like you said, folks, they want to share their knowledge, especially, you know, at a certain age. I mean, that's, it gives, you know, gives them something to look forward to. It gives, it makes them feel good. Um, older contractors, you know, just different businesses in general. I mean, this, this is a really good point. Let's talk about um, your employees. How, tell us how you started with employees and kind of what were some of the challenges and how it's going today. <clears throat> Man. Um, yeah, some of my guys, um, they've been with me for over 10 years. Um, the hard part about it, is you, you go through a bunch, you know, which I was pretty fortunate not to have to go through a bunch. Um, but I've, I've probably gone through four or five other employees besides the ones I have over the years. Some of them are just temporary guys. They'll just want to work here and there. Uh, we'll do a big project and we need labor. So we'll get labor, be able to move debris, bring in new stuff, drop things off, stage uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll pick up some guys there and it's usually like a friend of a guy that needs a job, you know, a guy that works for me had knows somebody that needs a job or they'll put a post on Facebook. Hey, we need guys that move things around for 12 bucks an hour or whatever it is. And they'll just be like, okay, cool. They come to work and they're like, can I be off by noon? And you're like, okay, that's cool. You can move stuff from seven till noon and not have to worry about paying them for a full day, you know? So it's kind of nice if you need temporary labor that way, but the full-time guys, uh, they've been with me. My, my shortest term guy has been here two years. So um, other than that, I have um, people that have been with me since day one and then people that have been with me for seven plus. So yeah, other than that, looking for people, I, I don't really do a lot of recruiting. I find it pretty difficult to recruit uh, because it takes a long time to train people in what we're doing. So unless they want to stick with it, uh, what I found useful is people that have other fields that they've been in and they're just like, in Washington, we have a unique thing called rain and it does it a long period of time in a row. So people that do paver work or patio work, they're outside. I have a guy uh, that's with me now, Kurt. He's been here for two years. I've known him for over 20 years. He was doing pavers and patios and stuff for a long time. And I was like, dude, get out of that rain. Cause he's, you know, he's like standing up. He's like, bang my back. And I was like, yeah, you got off that, get out of that rain. All that cold is bad for you. And just kind of harassing him at the house and one day we just started talking about it. And I was like, why don't you come do tile, man? It's the same thing as pavers. It's applied a little differently, but you already got the nuts and bolts of patterning and yep. laying it out. And I, mean, I think it'd be an easy transition for you. So I just kind of recruited him that way. And, you know, it was totally up to him as whether or not he would come on board. It wasn't, there was no pressure, but um, it made sense for him to come on and do that because now he's working and it's always 70 and the lights are on. It's, you know, so it's, it's nice. You don't have to wear, He's like, man, I'm happy I don't put my rain gear on in yeah. September and it stays wet until May, you know? So that's that's the good part about it. So appeal to find out find out their pain point, right? Find out their pain point, whether you're in Washington, Oregon, and you're you're working in the rain, you're gonna say, hey, we work inside over here. <laughs> that's awesome, I like that. Yeah. Or yeah. in Arizona, you know, different, different areas are gonna have different pain points. Um, and different employees have different pain points too. I mean, I, I think it's funny. Um, I, I don't know, maybe you can tell me how you do things. Um, but I know over the years, certain people will have like really young kids, maybe their, their spouse works too, and they have to get their kids off to school in the morning. So they need to show up a little later. I've heard 
you know, I've heard both sides of the story. What is your take on that? I mean, are you flexible with your employees? I mean, if they're a good, this came up in a conversation actually just yesterday. Uh, somebody was showing up 15 minutes late and, you know, the consensus was to fire them. But really, if they're a good employee and contractors are really struggling to find employees and they're actually good at what they do, are you willing to adjust your pride or maybe, you know, schedule and say, well, it is what it is. I mean, I know this guy's going to be there at, at 7, 15, 8, 15 instead of 7 or 8. What do you think? What are your thoughts on that? You trying to make me blush over here? <laughs> I got four guys that have that same problem right now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and myself. All of us have kids, you know. We're all in our mid thirties. Um, you know, right now I have two. They're they're pretty young, and they're both in elementary school. But they just said, you know, we're not going to start school. We're going to do a remote thing here. So you know, we're buying computers, and my wife works for the district, so she's like having to be at the school for some reason, and I have to be at work, and the kids are young, and we're, what are we going to do? You know. So yeah. reality is is I'm pretty flexible as far as I'm probably extremely flexible i would say because i think at the end of the day we take our boots off we ain't we're not tile guys we're family men you know that's yeah. and at the beginning of the day before we go to work we're family men so i talk to the customers and i say hey here's the deal i i literally at one point in time i was like between my crew we got 26 kids so wow. we're <laughs> we're trying to figure this out every day it depends on who has the flu or who threw up right. last night you wow. know it, it's always a thing you know someone's mom got sick. You know, I had three of my parents pass away in the last four years, you know, as far as my, my wife's parents and my parents. So three out of the four of our parents passed away. And, you know, those things, your home life affects your work life. Now yeah. you can't usually determine what's going to happen in your home life unless it's like, we're going to have dinner at six o'clock, you know, then you can make that happen. Right. But if kids are sick, weird things happen. Um, you have to be flexible. You can't be rigid, but you also have to be flexible for the right things. You can't just be ultimately flexible. Like, oh, you decided to stop at the coffee store. You got a Starbucks and now you're 10 minutes late. You know, that's that's one of those things that's not, you know, I don't think universally accepted. So, but if your kid's sick, you know, most people aren't going to be like, oh, no problem. Or we have late start Mondays, which is a school district thing where the kids don't even get on the bus till nine. Oh, wow. So how do you get the kids on the bus at right. nine to work at seven? Yeah. And it's like, well, I don't know. She's in second grade. She has to figure it out. You know, it doesn't really work. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You got, you got to be flexible. It sounds like communication all the way around. Communicate, yeah. with them, be, you know, be their friend as well as their boss as much as possible. You know, that's a, I know that's a hard thing to do at times, but um, communicate with them what's going on in their life and then communicate with your, with your, with your, uh, your customer as well. See yeah. From the get go. Yeah. This is the They'll way. The one to know. Yeah, for sure. And has COVID changed that too? I mean, are your kids in school or are they home? Are they homeschooling now or? Uh, right now they're on summer break. Uh, they'll be, I guess, I guess in the next couple of weeks, they'll be doing like a remote learning. So they won't be in school until who knows when, you know, yeah. we have over here. It's a little different, I guess. It just depends on who runs your state on what's going to happen with your kids and school and church and everything else. So um, you can, you can take a wild guess, you know, right. um, but they're supposed to start on November 3rd. That's really weird. Like November 4th, they're supposed to go back to school. So it's a funny day, but who knows? Right now they're not going to school. We got to get computers. We got to do remote learning, mm. uh, you know, so the kids will be doing their thing. And, and I'll try to make some sort of amends in my schedule, you know, trying to maybe I'll start an hour late. You know, my wife's trying to get off an hour early, kind of minimize those days. We have a sitter for the middle of the day. Uh, we'll, we'll do like I'll teach them some I don't know, I have a book, I guess, and they'll do their online thing, their Zoom meetings. And then my wife comes home. She's really good at this stuff. She also works for the school. So she'll be working with them for a couple hours after school. So hopefully it all works out. You know, if not, we might just go on vacation for two months. I don't know. I mean, the other guys have the same issues. You know, I got a guy that has a kid uh, during this whole COVID thing. He's had his kid for two weeks on, two weeks off because he's yeah. in custody. So they would minimize the exposure if there wasn't any, right? Yeah. Well, two weeks on, two weeks off is a big deal when you have childcare to consider for only two weeks. And, you, you know, it's a whole nother flexibility you have to have. So hold on one second here. Yeah, take care of it. <laughs> that was one of my kids. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No problem at all. And yeah. I think I, I, I'll just keep talking. You can do, do what you need to do for a minute. Um, but uh, the point is, is that, 
my heart goes out to like single parents right now, especially with the school. And, um, I mean, especially, you know, if you're having trouble with childcare and I mean, it's, it's crazy times. Um, so be flexible with yourself, be flexible and don't be afraid to tell your clients like, look, this is what's going on. I think that's kind of the bottom line here. Right. Yeah. They, they, they understand hundred percent. If they yeah. don't understand, they're not your customer. Just yeah. let them go because you have an obligation to your family. I mean, and making money is part of that, but being there is the biggest part of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I, I try to draw that line. Just let them know in the beginning, Hey, we, some days we won't be here till nine o'clock. A lot of times they call and they're like, well, hey, I thought you're going to be here at nine. I'm like, well, right now it's taking forever getting supplies at certain tile places or whatever because they have one or two people working and there's a line of guys. Shipping's weird. You know, I had a job we were supposed to start in August and we rescheduled for October because some stuff's not coming in until then. Other than that, you know, just let them know, hey, we may not be here till 9, 30, 10 o'clock, but we've been getting things for your job since seven. You know, <laughs> we're right. already on your job getting materials for you. You know, so yeah, um, yeah. I just communicate that to the customers. It's pretty easy. Let them know, and um, you know, you can figure out the rest. I mean, <clears throat> most anything that happens on site, you're there to replace the bad and put in the good, and yeah. make it look nice and quality job. So nothing on site should ever be dramatic. You know, other than the fact that you show up and communicate with the customers so they can get their groceries and go pick their kids up and all that too. So yeah. Yeah. I know, I know for me, when I, once I got employees, it was, it was like this big weight off my shoulders because before when I was by myself, maybe just with an apprentice, I really had a lot of attachment to that job. And there wasn't really anything that could stop me from being there, you know, late or early, you know, really getting that job done. But almost like once I shifted my mindset from, um, you know, single installer business owner, uh, to to more of a business owner who had employees, if something happened with my employees, whether they got sick or, or their kids or something, I could communicate much easier and much more freely with the client and say, hey, something's, you know, because because the employees were handling, you know, the bulk of the work, I would say, you know what, my employees and the client would, um, it always, you know, for a long time, it really surprised me. And then I, I just got really this sense of, that's just the way it is. I mean, they respect the fact that things come up. They actually do communication. You call them up and, and you say, well, look, this is what's going on, my guy. And it's not like, you know, you shouldn't really, you know, hopefully make a habit of that. But if, if it happens out of, you know, one out of six jobs, I mean, that's life. That's just the way it goes. Um, and you can miss a day or whatever. And all of a sudden it's almost like, well, it's not so much on me. It's like, we've got this complex, you know, system going here with yeah. multiple lives involved. So. Yeah, it's like an ultimate job site coordination. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Every, yeah, and that's what it is. When you when you take on, you know, I would say past a, a few employees, past a couple employees, your main job is coordin coordinating and, and communicating, and and really your main job is not installing. Even if you're still installing part time, um, your main job really needs to be. And that's that's I think that's why a lot of guys lose control after say five employees. It's really hard to go past that. If you're going to go past four or five employees and you're insisting on still installing tile 40 hours a week, you're going to really have a hard go of it, in my opinion. What do you say, David? Are you installing? Are you working with your hands? Hang on one second. Yeah, I'm installing and um, coordinating and doing all that other stuff, the fun stuff, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's just you know part of the life right now um there when it happened here uh we shut down they said construction was non-essential so we were shut down so we we uh you know we I, my guys couldn't work and i for like 76 days in a row just did everything i could do to get work going mm. so uh i have two modes you know i have regular mode and then i have like what i call recession mode since in 09 i worked you know 20 hour shifts Mm -hmm. uh, just to grab the next job the next morning at seven, go home and sleep for three hours and do that next one. So we would try to double up. And so that was kind of a weird thing I adapted to. Mm -hmm. um, and I hate when I get in that mode because I just turned like a zombie, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I bet. So how do you, how do you balance it? Are you, do you have a certain day or certain hours where you're kind of in the office, kind of making sure everything's on schedule and thinking about the future? Yeah. I try to manage it by not, 
I mean, try to not overload the, the schedule, you know, try to get two jobs at a time. So we'll, we'll usually run two jobs concurrently. Mm. That's our, that's our thing. If we had to do three, that would be kind of a stretch. So mm. I would have to have, I can do a couple two man crews and then have myself doing something else. Um, if that's an install, things can get a little hairy. Uh, if it's a small install, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, but coordinating, making sure everything's on site, making sure they have the right things, um, picking up the next job, doing estimates, measures, time, payroll, you know, all that other stuff goes into it too. Um, you know, working with the website team and all that stuff. And um, th those are like extracurricular activities that, um, you know, they take time. And when you're doing it, you need to do it within their business hours too. So you're cramming it into a condensed window and that makes it even more difficult. So I, I would, if I could do it over again from, you know, say five years ago, I would, I would really step aside even more um, than I am now, but slowly trying to take that foot out the door, you know, yeah. you try to step back and, and see, but I had to learn to let the guys fail. You know, sometimes things are going to happen and, you know, I try the best I can to teach them the way that they should be done. And um, I trust them all to do it now. It's not, there's not an issue, Yeah. Um, but I, I had that fear of failure and I'm like, okay, man, I, if I, if I'm not there, something can happen. And yeah. I'm like, okay, well, if I'm there, something bad's going to happen on the other end. You know, we're not going to be able to, you know, maybe my family life falls apart or, you know, we don't get the next job or I can't get to a measure and I'm estimating at 10 30, 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. And I still do sometimes when I can't sleep, you know, get up early and do it. But sure. most sure. of the time I try to try to limit my time there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that quote, David. Learn to let the guys fail. Yeah, you have to you have to let go sometimes. Like, yeah. you know, once it, once they kick that bird out of the nest, it either flies or dies, or you know, maybe it makes it on it, you know, maybe it hits the ground running or something, but you know, that's something's going to happen. And if you, if you never take that first step, you're not going to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, so. that's how you're going to identify a leader as well. And then, and then slowly, you know, get them to the position where you can promote them to be more of a leader in the company. That way you can, you know, like you're saying, it's, it's a transition period to where you're going to, you know, get your hands off the tools over, over time. Um, I, I like that. And, and then, you know, something you said towards the beginning of this episode was, you're utilizing, you're, you're kind of hiring people to, to manage certain aspects of the business. Can you talk, talk to us a little bit about that? Because, I mean, obviously you're, you're doing well at this, otherwise you wouldn't be able to install tile um, as much as you are with four employees, four or five employees. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe, I don't know what you mean by install as well as I am as, as much as I do or, but the well, thing I, is, I, I mean, I, I just mean who, um, you said like you have bookkeepers and things of that nature. Talk to us about hiring, you know, kind of like subcontracting or hiring professionals mm -hmm. to handle business things that, you know, you really shouldn't be doing unless you're, you know, trained at it. Well, yeah. Yeah. So um, basically, if I could go back in time from day one, I would have two more employees and I would just start off having more people that way because there, there's a fear in the beginning of affordability you know and obviously you have to make money and you have to have your overhead covered and you have to pay people and they have to make money so you have a respectable amount of money but as soon as i was able to start paying people i started paying people and l and i bookkeeping attorneys make sure things are right on contracts mm -hmm. uh, you know send have an attorney to send a contract to if you get one from a contractor they're like hey we got a job on base go ahead and start tomorrow and you know, we had the same scenario and I was like, I don't know about this, man. I had my attorney look over, you know, we got them on a retainer. They, they look over the, the, the contract yeah. and say, here's what we like. Here's what we don't like. Um, when they don't like it, then I just don't do it. And I just say, okay, amend it. We'll send it back. But without them, I get stuck in the situation. Like, did you know they weren't trying to pay you for like a year? You know, and you're like, oh, okay, well that's bad. And it's way down here in paragraph 15. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's good to have that. It's kind of spendy at first. You think about it, you're like, oh man, I don't want to spend a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks on this, but it could cost you thirty grand for a year. You know, on a job. Yeah. Um, but yeah, bookkeepers. I don't know. I I don't know about bookkeeping. You know, I'm I'm not an uh, an accountant. I can't do schedule C's and K ones and bring out the you know whatever the 1056 is and you know there's a bunch of different forms and everything transfers over from you know line one to line 100. So yeah. <clears throat> having the right people in the right place, just you have to pay the money. And if you have to pay the money, you have to make the money. So yeah. figure out what those numbers would be, you know, account that into 
you know, maybe it's 5% per job, you know, per year. I mean, I think my account, my bookkeeping is like 50 bucks a month. I think it takes them like, maybe, I don't know, it's all QuickBooks. So I'm sure they just rectify purchases yeah. and then account deposits to transactions. And it pretty much does itself. I mean, I probably could do it, but I just, like I said, not for I, mean, 50, not enough. For 50 bucks. I mean, if, yeah. if you're, if you're billing yourself out at, at $50, you know, let's say you were, an hour. I mean, that's one hour. I bet, you know, it would take probably a full day to do your own bookkeeping. I mean, it just yeah, makes sense. Brand new. <laughs> yeah. It just makes sense to, to hire the professional to do it. I mean, they're going to get it done in a much more timely fashion. I mean, this is, this is really what business is all about is utilizing your time at where you make the most money. And that's probably not bookkeeping if you're a flooring guy, if you're a tile guy. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about some some lead generation. How how are you generating new leads? Working with new contractors, new new contacts. Do you, mm -hmm. I, um, I have no problem cold calling, and like I can grab a book, you know, cold call people, talk to people, um, and call and ask for the right people. You know, most of the time, the owners of the companies they don't want to talk to you. It's the install coordination. You know, mm -hmm. so call and talk to the install coordinator. Call and talk to project. Uh, managers, you know, different companies. I There's companies that we work for. I've called and said, hey, can I talk to your project manager? And they're like, which one? I was like, not any of them's fine. <laughs> Just like, they're like, okay, I'll give you John. And I talked to John, like, hey, John, my name is Dave. This is what I do. Um, I see you guys are working in this area. This here's what we can offer. By the way, if you ever have any demolition needs, here's what we can do for you. And I'll send you over a PDF. You can see what our pricing is right up front. And then they're like, oh, geez. <clears throat> you get the pricing for the demolition. And they're like, wow, we're already paying way more than this. But that just opens the door for me to say, and we install. Mm -hmm. So they see what we do, then they hire us for the next one. But the demolition, um, um, we make money on because of the, the machinery. You know, it's already paid for. It, it works fast. Wow. Um, other lead generation is you can do, you know, targeted marketing. Um, it doesn't cost anything to do. Mm -hmm. So some of the stuff now, you know, they have next door apps and all these other things on, on your phone. <clears throat> what I did is I called a realtor and said, Hey, what do you know about this neighborhood? What kind of people live there? And kind of got the demographics of it. And where I live, it's like people work for big companies, you know, Amazon, Boeing, whatever. Um, SpaceX. I think there's like uh, Northrop Grumman, a lot of aerospace, a lot of other machinists and stuff. Then there's the base, you know, we have joint base Lewis McCord and all sorts of industry around here. So um, I'd call a realtor and ask them, you know, what do you know about this neighborhood? Or I'd take a drive and go to the model home and see what the pricing's like. And then I would target that neighborhood. You know, I would send out a next door thing. I would join their neighborhood and I would just post pictures of what I do in there. Just say, hey, just finish this neighbor's job. Check it out, blah, blah, blah. And people are like, oh, my God. And then they'll give you a call or they'll send you a message. Usually, you know, you get the message in there and then there's like, Hey, we're thinking about doing this. Mm -hmm. And you go, okay, what's your address or, you know, what time works for you? And you set up an appointment. And, um, I would do like, we, we did, we started doing carpet when we first started Carp, You know, when I first started, it was like, you did everything carpet, hardwood, tile, vinyl. Mm -hmm. So I would do a, do like a one room restretch for free. Mm -hmm. And then they'd be like, oh, once one room looks good, they look at the others. They're like, oh, what about these rooms? I'm like, okay, it's, you know, 150 a room after, you know? So you'll you'll get money or you'll get a new job or they're like, yeah, we're going to tear this out next year. And you just write that down, put it in the yeah. calendar, you know, generate, self-generate your leads that way. Uh, I've used lead sourcing, um, you know, the different websites. I don't know if I should name any names of websites, but. Uh, just other websites where you pay for lead generation. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> and what I found is, you know, a lot of times that doesn't work so hot because they're selling 10 leads to five guys, you know, wow. and whoever gets there first, and it's kind of a race to the bottom. I didn't really like racing to the bottom because you get the job and you're like, well, crap, I can't make any money because they're price shopping. And it's like <clears throat> really wholesale flooring uh, leads. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are trying to get the bargain. Uh, so I just, I stopped doing that, but yeah. And then, people we've worked for shop wise over the last 15 years. You know, I constantly call them say, Hey, how's things going? And we just call and talk about stuff like little, little kids, little league baseball and you know what they have going on in their life. And then that's it. Yeah. We might not even talk about work. We just talk about what's going on because I've been friends with them so long. 
now we just talk about life and okay well hey man i got this coming up i got this coming up and they're like okay we got something coming up too and we just kind of bounce it off each other then you get the email or the phone call hey send me a message i sent you uh I sent you a floor plan, you know, I needed some numbers or whatever, you know. Nice. Yeah. I, I, I like, I like all of it, David. I, I'd like to kind of emphasize um, on this, you know, carpet analogy, the free, you now we're not, I'm not a carpet installer, but you said we'll do a free restretch of your room. I know what you're talking about that. And you were just yeah. putting it out there, right? I've seen companies mm -hmm. do this, uh, big and small companies. It's, this is a great way to generate leads. I mean, and for tile, you could do a free uh, backsplash caulking line, you know, and, and just have a nice picture of the of the cracked grout that, you know, we're all very familiar with, with a backsplash or a shower for that matter in the corner where mm -hmm meets the hard surface and then just say, we, you know, we're going to offer this, uh, we're going to schedule one a week and, and just fill your calendar out that way, get your foot in the door, make that connection. Um, I mean, I could see a, a large company just having an employee going around doing these free caulking jobs. Just it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's just advertisement. This is promotion. This is how you grow. This is, you got to think outside the box. You've got to think like this. If you're young in business and you're sitting at home with no work, offer something small for free say hey look you Absolutely. buy a 30 dollar bottle of silicone and we'll come silicone your backsplash for you and it's not going to cock again it's not going to grout it's not going to crack again the, the grout is cracking because they they grouted it and just make a little ad like that you know make the copy and then put it out there on next door put it out there on facebook put it out there um i mean you could literally send flyers to neighborhoods that you wanted to work in then yeah. guess what? You get your foot in the door. You have a few pleasantries. Uh, they're over the moon with you, and and you've you've potentially made a client for life. I mean, you know, their shower might need a remodel. They might need a new floor. All these different beautiful things could come out of that. The point is, get out there and hustle. If if you're not if you're not working right now, you should be working at something. You're a business owner. You've got to change your mindset. You've got to go out there, step outside your comfort zone cold call people do something for free get your foot out there get your name out there that's how that's how it happens so yeah and, and um i i started doing that probably i don't know seven or eight years ago because you know this whole internet thing's relatively new with the hand phones right. and all the apps and all that but um they uh there's a podcast and the guy said the, the title was the power of free you know right. so okay i'll listen to this guy and i don't want to plug him on here but he he uh he has Really good. Oh, it, it's the, the name of the podcast is the John Altucher show. Oh yeah. John Altucher. James, I mean, it's like, the James, James Altucher. Yeah, yeah. James Altucher. Yeah. It's like the, it's like the first, and uh, so within the first 10 episodes, there's a podcast about brainstorming business ideas and the power of free, you know, don't be afraid to do stuff for free and, you know, create your name. So I just kind of started doing that. And you're right with the tile side, you could do, you know, caulking or you could do, ceiling or you could do whatever um, but <clears throat> yeah you always ask people you ask people you know hey we'll do this one thing or we're looking for i did a christmas time like everybody's notoriously want things done can you get done before thanksgiving can you get it done by christmas right all right like we got family coming by we got you know kids you know all this other stuff so thanksgiving christmas time i'll put out a blast in the middle of october and i'm like hey don't forget to make those carpets look good for thanksgiving don't forget to make things look nice for Christmas. How's this? And then I'll need 10 customers. I'm going to do this for free. 10 customers. You'll get a hundred replies. hundred people will be like, I need that for free. Yeah. And first thing get it, the next 90 are customer leads. So then you call and you call them and say, Hey, you know, you can see the reply list here. What we can do is half price, you know, and then you get, you, you're generating revenue. These things take a short period of time and you could do that. And then by the way, since I'm here, what else would you like to have me look at? And they'll tell you what's wrong with their house. I mean, they know they're like been looking at this thing forever going, man, this thing needs fixed. I don't know how to do it. It costs an arm and a leg and, um, you know, just work on that side. You know, you can generate business by being directly in front of customers that way. Offered something for free, did some for free, generated revenue, generated leads more importantly, because look what people pay for leads. I mean, there's lead generating companies that are, I don't know if they make billions of dollars, but lots of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. you know, Selling things to people over and over and over. Yeah. And these people are going to be in your direct area. You're not going to have to travel 100 miles to see them. You know, it'll be pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I, I love that James Altucher. I used to listen to him a lot, not so much anymore, but 
I used mm -hmm. to listen to him. He's a mark. He's a marketing genius. That guy. He's good. Oh yeah. All right. Well, um, if anybody has any questions uh, for David or myself, put them up in the comments. We're winding this down. David, tell us about what's in store. Where do you see yourself in five, 10 years? Where are you taking your business? Uh, five, 10 years. Hopefully I'm not putting any tile on the floor anymore. And these calluses maybe on the top of my hands have gone away a little bit. Yeah. You know, I got the, I got the gorilla fingers from walking around on tile. Um, I, I got a couple guys I'm, I'm looking to promote. Nice. actively there i have some i have a pretty good team and i think we can spread out um and get a couple i don't want to say apprentices but maybe we'll start doing subcontracting a couple and just have these guys do like some quality control mm -hmm. um, i know some pr other installers that are really good too that they're like one or two men at a time and we can we can attract more business and sub it out and have my guys make sure those jobs are going well and and do more do more i you know i thought at one point I wanted to open up like a brick and mortar type thing. I'm not sure if that's the way to go. There's a lot of overhead and right now we're, we're really low on overhead. Um, but honestly, I don't have a set path. You know, I, I, I know that I don't want to be tied down forever um, to installing because I won't be able to grow the business higher than I am probably right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to get to where I want to be, um, you know, I have to let go of more control. You know, that's basically it. I have to, I have to let the day happen and deal with it tomorrow and, and um, expect my guys to do the right thing as, as I've been there for 15 years with them, they know, um, yeah. and then they respect me and I respect them. And they know that if something happens and I'll say something about it, if nothing happens, I'll tell them good job, you know, mm -hmm. and I never complain if it's good. So that's right. how, that's how it goes. I mean, if you don't hear something from the boss, People take it like, oh, they didn't tell me good job. It's like, no, they didn't say anything at all. That's the best. That's like the best compliment other than like, hey, thanks a lot for a good job. Some people need that every time, you know, but other times if the boss doesn't say anything, you're like, man, I go to work every day. And my boss just doesn't have to say nothing to me. Then you're like the best, most valued employee. And that's an inside secret, you know, yeah. so we need. Yeah. So I don't know, five, 10 years from now. I mean. That's a big reflection. You know, I don't know. I didn't see myself here 10 years ago for, for sure. Uh, yeah. We were just coming out of the last recession and, um, you know, who, who knew what was going to happen there. And with the pandemic and stuff now, I, I have honestly, I know I'm going to be working. I'm going to I'm going to put forth my efforts every day and keep yeah. making calls and contacts and grow yeah. the company. Um, and, but I'm going to turn the turn the company in from a job into a business. And that's that's my that's transition. I'm working right now, you know. Well, that's the vision right there. I, I think you just hit the nail on the head. And I like having those bigger visions, those bigger goals. Hey, I'm going to get myself off the tools in, in five mm -hmm. years. That's going to be, I'm not going to I'm not going to necessarily, you know, spell out this. I'm going to let the, you know, I'm going to let things happen organically, but that's really my end goal. That's my, that's always in the back of your mind, or should I say in the front of your mind, that's, mm -hmm. Whether it be whether it be five or three or ten years, you know that's your goal. Is I need to get myself on the tools. I want to I want to get this business functioning more like a business. I want to be a business owner, you know, put people in place, and 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 that is the goal. And I think I think that's what it is. So I like those I like those kind of round, nice round goals, David. So I you're gonna get there, man. Yeah, there's some little pointed things in there, but I don't kill you with details. You know, it's, sure. you're it's like we could analyze those things all day. I just think like ultimately yeah, um, big sure. picture. I've had a job for, I've been doing flooring for 18 years. So um, if I stopped installing flooring, would I, would I hate it? No. You know, mm -hmm. um, I always love my job because I get to create nice things, uh, yeah. but I've had a job for 18 years. Now I need yeah. to have a business and let other people do the job. So that, right. that's my overall goal. Right. Yeah. That's awesome, David. Well, I appreciate the time you've taken here before, you know, scheduling, schedule before getting out of the house and, and sharing your knowledge. I know it's going to benefit a lot of people, David. So yeah, no problem. It. It's been my pleasure. All right. Have a great day, David. Thanks a lot, Luke. Yep. All right, Tile friends. Thanks for joining me on this live recording of uh, the podcast episode. If you're listening to this in the future, um, you can watch these live Typically throughout the week, I'll let you know in my Facebook group and uh, on Instagram on, on where where I'm going to be or when I'm going to be recording these. Uh, I'm actually going to record one here in an hour with with Aunt uh, Aunt uh, Primo. 
on Instagram at, at Primo. You guys might know him. You've seen some of his LED work. We're going to talk about LEDs and, and tile and, and kind of, you know, um, marketing like that. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. So, um, I do want to take a minute here to thank uh, one of my patrons. Uh, I want to thank David San Sandana. He's actually the, the gentleman I just interviewed. Thank you, David, for, for being a patron and a supporter of Tile Money financially. I, I do appreciate it. Uh, there's a link where you're watching this or on my website, tilemoney.com. If you'd like to support me, if you're benefiting from the work I'm doing um, and you are financially able to, of course, uh, don't don't go um, into debt doing this, but if, if you're in a position to do so, even just $5 a month really makes a difference for me and allows me to keep doing this. We've got some good stuff coming down the pipe here for Tile Money. Uh, we're gonna be releasing uh, a whole new kind of season three here really soon. Uh, and I'm gonna be sh showcasing a lot of details. We're gonna be hitting the road nationwide in 2021. And we're gonna be doing uh, some business incubators in person. Those are gonna be live streamed uh, and those are gonna be really fun. Uh, we had our first one and it, it was a blast. We're gonna do some, we're gonna do 12 more of these in 2021. This is gonna be really, uh, uh, really, uh, fun thing, and and I'm confident that um, it's going to benefit a lot of people. We're not we're not stopping here at this podcast. We're we're continuing to uh, build tile money up and, and help tile contractors everywhere. That is my goal: is to make tile contracting uh, profitable, sustainable, and, and really attractive. I want to attract more young people to this trade. That's what we need, and the only way we can do that is by strengthening. Uh, you tilers out there, contractors out there, strengthening your businesses, uh, making it into a brand as, as, um, as HUDs would say at HUDs, we want to make tiling a brand so that people just recognize tiling as a, as a great trade that it is and, and really something that people should get into. So that's it for me for now. Uh, I'll be back on here actually in about an hour and then you'll probably see me next week. Um, as always, stay profitable, Tile friends. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, I want to thank David again for being a guest and sharing his wisdom as well as being a patron. Go to tilemoney.com to see what I'm up to and get on my email list and, and all that good stuff. So, all right, Tile friends, talk to you later.